there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission. One message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. Welcome to the program. I'm Rick Wiles. Today is Wednesday, September 19, 2012. The war drums are not only beating loudly in the Middle East today, they are suddenly beating loudly in Asia as a defiant China confronts Japan over ownership of a disputed chain of islands that lie near strategic shipping lanes and fishing grounds. There are also potential oil and gas reserves near the islands. Of course, this is not about who owns and controls the islands, but who is the big daddy of Asia. That's what this is all about. China is making it clear it is prepared to fight for control of the islands. A high-level Chinese PLA general issued a war threat yesterday. General Xu told PLA troops to prepare for combat. And a commentary in the official news media outlet of the Chinese Military, the PLA Daily, warned Japan that it is playing with fire. The commentary stressed that while the Chinese public yearns for peace, peace had to be built on mutual respect and not threaten China's territorial integrity. Last night, the London Telegraph reported that a senior advisor to the Chinese government has called for an attack on the Japanese bond market to precipitate a funding crisis and to bring Japan to its knees unless Tokyo reverses its decision to nationalize a chain of islands in the East China Sea. Jin Pasong from the Chinese Academy of International Trade, which is a branch of the Chinese Commerce Ministry, said China should use its power as Japan's biggest creditor with $230 billion of government bonds to impose sanctions on Japan in the most effective manner and bring Tokyo's crisis to a head. Writing in the Communist Party newspaper, China Daily, Mr. Jin called on China to invoke the security exception rule under the World Trade Organization to punish Japan, rejecting arguments that a trade war between the two Pacific giants would be mutually destructive. Separately, the Hong Kong Economic Journal reported that China is drawing up plans to cut off Japan's supplies of rare earth minerals, mineral, excuse me, uh, minerals needed for high tech industry. Also, China dispatched three naval patrol boats to the islands yesterday. Japan responded by deploying 50 patrol boats to the area in the East China Sea. Violent protests against Japan have spread across. China in recent days, Japanese stores, restaurants, and car dealerships in China were attacked by mobs. Protesters called uh, Japanese, excuse me, protesters referred to the Japanese as dogs. Some signs demanded that the USA repay the trillion dollars owed to China. A car transporting U.S. Ambassador Gary Locke was attacked by a Chinese mob yesterday. The car was damaged, but the ambassador escaped without injuries. Chinese protesters surrounded the ambassador's vehicle as he tried to enter the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. Europe is bracing for Islamic violence after a French magazine said it would publish cartoons mocking the prophet Muhammad. One of the cartoons, entitled Muhammad, A Star is Born, depicted a bearded figure crouching over to display his naked buttocks and genitals, a star covering his anus. The magazine hit the newsstands today in Paris and throughout the country. The editor said the cartoons would shock those who want to be shocked. 
The French government said it would immediately close 20 embassies in Muslim-dominated nations. More Muslims, Muslim leaders today called for a global UN treaty to outlaw criticism of Islam. Now, personally, I suspect that the publication of the cartoons in the French magazine is part of a deliberate strategy by the Illuminati to spark the opening shots of World War III. Nobody in their right mind would pour gasoline on a fire at this time. Furthermore, I suspect that the publication of the cartoons has given France a legitimate cover to evacuate their ambassadors and embassy personnel before the war starts very soon. Iranian news outlets reported today that the Iranian army displayed the existence of underground missile launching silos. Iranian journalists were permitted to accompany Alatola Ali Khamenei as he visited the silos. The silos have the capability of launching long-range missiles from underground launch pads against surface targets. The Times of London reported that the Syrian government drew up plans to transfer chemical weapons to Hezbollah. The revelation was made by a Syrian general who defected. He had been in charge of Syria's chemical weapons stockpile. Major General Adnan Salou told the London newspaper that Damascus had plans in place to use the chemical weapons in battles against rebels. According to General Salou, over the summer, top government officials held a meeting south of Damascus to discuss the use of chemical weapons. The plan included gassing opposition fighters and civilians, the, in particular in the town of Aleppo. Uh, General Sulu told the paper that Syria had been kept from such a move for fear of consequences in the international arena, but now has nothing to lose. He said, if another war breaks out between Israel and Hezbollah, it will only help the Syrian regime, talking about the use of chemical weapons. On Monday, a German magazine, Der Spiegel, reported that in August, the Syrian government, with the help of Iranian military advisors, tested weapons that could carry chemical warheads. Rumors have spread in recent days about a mass mobilization of Israeli troops. We now know why. The Israeli army launched a surprise, large-scale training exercise today, mobilizing all of its troops to the border with Syria. Military Chief Lieutenant General Benny Gantz ordered the exercise to test the competence and preparedness of the Israeli armed forces. Tens of thousands of soldiers were mobilized for the exercise, including artillery and Air Force personnel, making the drill unique because of the number of soldiers and senior officers involved. As part of the exercise, troops were dispatched by air from central parts of the country to the Israeli-controlled part of the Golan Heights, captured from Syria in the 1967 Mideast War. The drill ended with live fire exercises in the Golan Heights. And as the Israeli military braces for war, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security is bracing for civil war inside America. A new solicitation for over 200 million rounds of ammo was made public this week on a government procurement website. The latest request for purchase is the uh, is on top of a uh, 1.2 billion rounds of ammo already ordered by Homeland Security. One thing that is troubling a lot of American gun owners is that some of this ammo is specifically for snipers. Now, on a personal note, during a visit to my hometown of Hagerstown, Maryland, earlier this year, I was told by close friends that there is a mysterious factory in the center of the city, in fact, in the south end of the city, near Wilson Boulevard, that few residents know what goes on inside the factory. Men working in the plant have confided to my friends that they are manufacturing sniper trucks for the Department of Homeland Security. One employee told my friend, you don't want... You don't ever want to see one of these vehicles pulling up in the driveway of your house. You have sniper trucks for Homeland Security. Is there any wonder why they're buying ammo for snipers? Now listen, anybody who fails to understand what is happening right now is in deep denial. Fractional reserve banking is collapsing. Fiat paper currencies are collapsing. The Western banking system is imploding. 
European nations and the USA are drowning in government debt and have to be financed by countries such as China. At the same time, a global Islamic uprising is underway. NATO is preparing to invade Syria. Israel is poised to attack Iran. And China is challenging Japan for control of Asia. A dictatorship is forming in the USA. Homeland Security is stockpiling enough ammo to shoot every American citizen several times. There are rumors, unconfirmed rumors, of Russian Spetsnaz commandos infiltrating into the USA. We know that a Russian submarine patrolled the Gulf of Mexico for a month, and we know that Russian strategic nuclear bombers penetrated U.S. airspace at California and Alaska several months ago. And, according to Russian newspapers, nuclear missiles are back in Cuba. All of this is happening when the U.S. has an imposter president in the White House, a charlatan, a foreign plant, a godless communist agitator. He was placed there for such a time as this. Because of the rising danger, I will be saying less in the days ahead. This is a time for every person to activate their emergency preparedness plans for the safety and survival of your families. Regardless of who wins the election, even if we have an election, there will not be a transfer of power. A decision has been made. A secret plan is in motion. Something is underway in the world that will threaten the survival of the USA and the entire West. I firmly believe the USA will enter a police state, possibly within weeks, no doubt in my mind, before the end of this year. The black ubiquitous membrane that we have prophesied for years on this radio program is ready to descend over the nation. It will suffocate freedom. You have been warned by this watchman. Act accordingly. At this point, I'm not going to take a break as usual on the program. I just want to continue with this theme, and I've I've asked my friend Aaron Brickman to return. Uh, Aaron is a, a private invest, investor, a businessman, and uh, he's a person who's taught me a lot about the role of cycles in investing. And we had Dr. Steve Pitts on the program last week who explained to us his theory about a correlation between lunar cycles and major collapses of stock markets. And I, I had uh, Aaron on the program following Mr. Pitts's uh, interview to help us understand it. We ran out of time. I asked Aaron to come back, and the world has changed quite a bit in one week. Aaron, um, I want to get into um, continuing to talk about the, the cycles in, in the stock market, but before we go there, let's just take a little bit of time to talk about the geopolitical events that are taking place right now since you were last on the program. I mean, we, we've wa- we're watching uh, now China rise up against uh, Japan. Uh, we're seeing the protests with the Islamic uh, mobs around the world. W- what are your thoughts as you watch these things? Well, Rick, uh, again, it's good to be on the program, and thank you for having me back. To be honest, I just can't keep up with it all anymore. I mean, it's, it's, I think we've, I think we've flipped the switch. I feel like I'm living in an alternate reality some days. Um, I, my it's, background is I double majored in history and political science, and I've studied cycles and economics, and, but it's, I feel like it's now getting to the point where the news cycle is, is overtaking the ability to even process it and report it. It's surreal. It's very surreal. It's like this isn't happening. It's so bizarre. Very, very bizarre. And 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 I know exactly what you're saying. I at times I'm I'm ready just my mind, my spirit just to shut down and say, I I just don't need I don't need to know anymore. It's this is out of control now. That's the way I feel. I mean I think we've been warned of these events, the God's raised up prophetic men and women who have been able to see 
in part, and I think we're seeing the details, or at least the outline now. Um, timing is always tricky, only the Lord knows that, but it clearly, prudence would dictate that that times are changing, and they're changing by the hour, and... You know, this is just the stuff that's being reported. This isn't the this isn't the real reality that the military and the intelligence agencies and very connected people on Wall Street are, are aware of. So, as dark as it as the mainstream media is, it's the reality is much more ominous behind the scenes. Yes, it is, and there, I, I have been, I have been given. Uh, let me put it like this. Um, Tidbits of important information have come my way in recent weeks from various sources that clearly it was it was divinely ordained by God that people that I know would hear a conversation, be told something by somebody in a high level position to know. Oh, it's been a number of things. I mean, I'm, I'll give you an example. We had Nathan Leal here a week or two ago. Nathan was told by a person, I, I can't give out the person's uh, position, but he was at a party in which uh, a, a person at that party, uh, it was a birthday party for a family member, and that person was a retired U.S. government uh, intelligence agency employee who confided uh, to to Nathan's friend that there will be a food shortage and food will be offered in return for the surrender of firearms, that there will be a food for guns exchange program. And this person said, this is not just a rumor, it's not a conspiracy, I have seen the working documents for this plan. I mean, we know about Doug Hagman's source. There, there, there has been a steady flow, Aaron. And you and I have conversations privately. You know what I'm talking about. Various people are telling me things. That, and it's like, why is this? How is this coming to me? Why is this flooding in right now? And I'll, I'll, I'll give our listeners another one again without giving out the source. I just happened to be talking to somebody who visited our office. Somebody who lives here in Vero Beach, well, not Vero Beach, in, let's, let's say the Treasure Coast of, of Florida, uh, who, um, not knowing what I do, what I say, w- what this program is about, but as the conversation changed, this person uh, confided to me that her brother, formerly worked in the White House under a former administration at a very high level, and that he was telling her privately that many people in that former administration are concerned that Mr. Obama will not leave the White House, and that these this her brother is making private plans for his own protection and safety around the election. Now, Aaron, this stuff is coming to me like this, these bits and pieces of information, but it's flowing almost daily now. And we're getting we're getting a picture that something very ominous is underway right now. And I suspect that will continue that will continue and actually increase exponentially as the days become more Ominous, and, and the events pick up. I mean, at, at a certain, you know, when they're working behind the scenes year after year, it, they can keep a certain amount of secrecy and a certain um, limited people in the loop. But as you get closer to the event, um, more people have to be brought in, and you get leaks like this. Um, so this doesn't surprise me. I think it's indicative of of the hour or how close we are to the hour. Yes. I, I was told today by a, a source who has a lot of, of business contacts in the oil industry that last Friday a decision was made and he said this has not been this is not public knowledge and I have not had time even today to even verify that it hasn't been 
publicized yet. He said it has not been publicized yet that last Friday a decision was made that Russia will supply China with a significant amount of oil over many years and that China will pay for the oil in Chinese yuan currency, not using the U.S. dollar as the um, global reserve currency for the transaction of oil sales, and uh, that this decision will be made known in the near future. But he said, I know for a fact it's a done deal. It's already the deal was sealed last Friday. Well, Aaron, you know the impact that decision is going to have on the markets when that comes out in the public. Right, and they've, and, you know, the BRIC nations have had these agreements. They've been moving them along slowly. These basically bilateral trade agreements outside, you know, basically swapping their own nation's currency and bypassing the dollar as the reserve currency, uh, which obviously puts less demand on the dollar, less bids on the dollar. Um, with QE3, with unlimited printing of money, it should not come as a shock to people. If you're, if you're holding something you deem to be of value and another party begins to just create it exponentially and without limits, it devalues whatever that object is. It, this is... I don't blame necessarily Russia and China for that agreement. That's we're printing funny money, and they know it. And, and China is holding trillions of it, and they're they don't want any more of it. Um, Aaron, um, when when the Federal Reserve announced last week QE three, what as a, as an investor, what what did that signify to you? Well, I got to be honest. I was, you know, smart men like Peter Schiff and Egan von Gries, and there's just a host of men that you've interviewed and, and followed. And I mean, everybody knew it was coming. Eventually, the debate was whether it would be in front of the election or not. I think they. My assessment is they panicked. My assessment is that it, obviously they know what's going on behind the scenes with the banks. This money is not going to you or me. It's not going to be loaned out. None of QE1 or 2 was loaned out. This is basically to backstop the banks and the derivatives. And um, it's going to drive up food prices. It's going to obviously the immediate effect was gold and silver. Um, and they said this is unlimited. It's unlimited. And, and it has to be unlimited because their debt that they're sitting on while it's not unlimited it's it's beyond it defies imagination when when, so, when we say it's un, that, that this announcement of QE3 the uh, more money printing that, it, that they said it's unlimited what it means is there will not be a QE4 5 6 or 7 because what Mr. Bernanke said last week is from now on we're not going to stop it's 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 till the moon turns blue we're just going to print money. Of course, Jim Willie's been telling us this all along, that it's it's a continuous, uh, endless printing of money. Uh, Jim Sinclair has been saying the same thing. It's print money, you know, for eternity. Uh, so, but they're they're now publicly confessing and admitting that they're going to run the printing presses twenty four seven. Well, and they've shot their last round. They. The public is beginning to wake up, and Wall Street. If there's, if there is a, another dip, if I mean the recent, the economy, the economy and Wall Street are are two different economies. Um, but if the if Wall Street, if the numbers for the economy keep coming in as poorly as they have the last couple of months, what's their solution? There is no solution. They they should they, the markets are going to eventually call. The Fed's bluff. Uh, we used to have in the, the late 90s and turn of the century, we had the Greenspan put. We now have the Bernanke put. Basically, it's this belief that they will do whatever they can to and whatever is in their power to maintain the, the price of the stock market. Aaron, what? To, no, go ahead. Sir. And it was referred to as the Greenspan put. It's now the Bernanke put. Um, I take issue with that. I mean, 
the market will at some point, and it always does, it will overwhelm the ability of the controllers. And I think that that's where Steve Pitts comes in is identifying these windows, and all they are is is conditions, almost like a hurricane. You know, we know some of the, the conditions that have to be present for the creation of a hurricane. That doesn't guarantee that the hurricane will form, and it certainly doesn't guarantee the, in, the intensity of it, but these are conditions, and I think that that's what Steve puts in that interview was we were trying to lay out is, is we are entering, the conditions are there, a time window is opening, uh, war, or at least rumors of war are swirling, which would give the controller's good cover for losing control, and it would be prudent for investors to um, to note that and to understand that that it's not business as usual anymore. The market, through a number of of metrics, is extremely overvalued right now. Uh, bullishness is approaching what's considered record levels that usually are indicative of tops, or at least a topping formation. Steve Putz laid out some time windows. So, I mean, it seems like the conditions are at least are at least forming. Aaron, last night when I read that the French satirical magazine was going to publish these cartoons mocking the Islamic prophet Muhammad, showing him, you know, butt naked, I just... I can't believe this. Who in their right mind would do this right now with with tensions this hot? I mean, to me, my first thought was this is deliberate. This is a calculated decision by the Illuminati. This is this is this this is being done to deliberately stoke the fire, make it red hot, get this war going. What do you think, Aaron? Well, I couldn't agree more. You know, I am <clears throat> I have. I do not support the, the Muslim faith. I am, I am not a Muslim. I am a Christian. <clears throat> so, but having said that, can you imagine had that French newspaper done that to Jesus Christ? I, I mean, <clears throat> it's just... Well, if they did it, nobody it's would... It's sensitive. It's beyond... It, there, right. there is a method to their madness. Yes. It, there's, it, it, it's totally... In this, in this environment, it can... To me, it can only be for one reason, and immediately, you know, they announced the closure of 20 embassies throughout the Middle East as an excuse. I, I think it's a pretext. They're, they're, clear, they're clearing out the embassies. Absolutely. I mean, we had, I'm sure you've reported, you know, the, the embassy in Beirut is to be reported um, destroying uh, sensitive material mm -hmm. inside the U.S. embassy right now in anticipation of an evacuation. So uh, the next day, you you have it reported uh, this incident with the French embassies. Um, I think they created a, 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 a pretext, and I think it's. I think a lot of the public is going to be able to see that. Mm -hmm. What 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 was your thought on this uh, Chinese threat to take down the the Japanese bond market? Well, the Chinese make a lot of threats. Uh, you've interviewed some some scholars who who have noted that. However, the Chinese are going to, the Chinese are positioning for the downfall of the United States, and they're, they've, they've got a couple of scores to settle with the Japanese. There's no love lost between those two societies historically, and um, I think the, the Chinese are going to, to use the chaos, to use the global confusion, the inability of the United States to to stick its finger in every hole in the dike, and I suspect that the Chinese will, I mean, at some point, it would not surprise me if tomorrow morning we're hearing about the Chinese and the island of Taiwan and the issues they have with them. I mean, I think we're going to see a lot of outbreak of hostilities. I would suspect that China will move to regain territory like Taiwan and the various islands while the U.S. is busy fighting Muslims in the Middle East. I mean, I would. I mean, you know, nations are are no different than. I mean, they are run by men. They are no different. They they do things in their own self interest. Um, I would expect China to to operate within its own self interest, and it's debatable 
you know, it's debatable whether they would actually dump the Japanese bond market, but rest assured, if that happens, everybody goes down with that ship. All right. And I mean, every every go the economy would crash within 24 hours. I mean, you cannot have a wholesale dumping of of the Japanese bond market, and that would precipitate selling on U.S. Treasuries, and there you go. That's right. But there have it been would certainly be an inj- it would certainly be a another way to attack the United States indirectly. Mm-hmm. But there have been some prophetic dreams that people have had about a global financial crisis emanating from Tokyo and waves of of financial collapse going out like ripples in in a lake uh, leaving Tokyo going time zone to time zone closing markets so when when I read that last night that was my first thought here we go um if Tokyo sinks it will it will be the beginning of the crash of, of, of the whole economic system. All right, let's let's go back and talk. Uh, let's pick up where we were at last week. We were talking about Dr. Steve Pitts and his theory where he links market crashes with lunar cycles. Uh, f- give us the, you know, the, the Brickman synopsis 101 of that theory. Well, simply put, just to shortly reiterate what, what you covered in that last hour with him, is that market panics, he identified that eight of the greatest crashes <clears throat> all have the same signature. Subsequent to this writing, there's been about four or five more crashes that you could add to the list that, that we covered last time. So we're, we're definitely, you know, 12 to 14 that, that, that have been identified that have the following signature, and it's that the market begins to panic six days before to three days after a full moon that occurs, it must occur within six weeks of a solar eclipse. We have a solar eclipse in mid-November. So the Steve Pitts postulate would be that a you basically find your full moons as the panics could begin as early as Monday, September 24th, or and it could cover all the way basically out to mid-December. Um, historically, they have the panics typically come after the full moon, after the solar eclipse. However, one of the um, one of the most notable crashes that defied that and occurred before the solar eclipse, of course, was the Great Crash in 1929. So, the Pitts postulate is it can be on either side. It typically is after the solar eclipse, but it could be before. And with the hostilities that we have seen even in the last week since that interview, um, I had postulated that you know the the panic could begin as soon as Monday the the twenty fourth. We're now seeing um, certainly rumors of wars swirling. Um, I would I would want to stop and be very clear. I am not saying the panic begins on Monday the twenty fourth. I am saying that that the conditions are now it, it's eerie that the conditions are now forming near those windows. and ha- Have we seen any other omens, you know, like the Hindenburg? We've seen Hindenburg omens in July, which are good for four months. They were triggered twice in the last week of July. Um, not every Hindenburg omen ends in a cataclysmic crash. However, all crashes have had those signatures. Um, we've got... And can you can you explain? I mean, in layman's term, what a Hindenburg omen is? Well, a Hindenburg omen is going to have to. It has to do with new highs and new lows and advanced decline. And there's about seven caveats. To, it's an extremely complex indicator. If you if if anybody's interested in it, they could Google Hindenburg omen. It'll give you the exact because it's really I think about seven. Seven criteria that have to be fulfilled. If one of those seven is not fulfilled, you don't have it. So it's an extremely specific technical marker, um, and it, we don't have them all the time. And, what, and basically, what it what it shows is that you have a dichotomy in the market. You have extremes both ways in a very short amount of time. So you're generating a lot of highs, a lot of lows, 
in a short amount of time, and that's just that's a fractured market. Okay, you know, so, you, so there was a Hindenburg, two Hindenburg omens in the market in July. They're good for four months, which means a, a crash could take could take place four months within four months of a Hindenburg omen. That would take us up to November, but as you said. Not all Hindenburg omens end in a crash, but all crashes have had a Hindenburg omen. Correct. Right? I mean, 2008, 1987, 1929. Um, they're going to have they're going to have those technicals, and there's a number of other technicals that that people would look for. Um, uh, the amount of bullishness that is prevalent in the market. Um, we're getting into. There was an article today posted on Zero Hedge about this exact topic, noting that we're now approaching the levels of bullishness seen at the 2008 high, the 2007 high. It's uh, we're not quite there yet, but we're you know you get these, these these crashes. Crashes occur not because there's a because there's a there's a balance within the market. It, it occurs when you have a high distribution in one direction. Typically, obviously, it would be bullish. And a source of data, an event, whatever it is, comes out to instantly change the herd. Of course, not everybody can sell at the same time. You have a lack of bid in the market, and you have a crash. So I would think, having having played a couple of crashes in the past, but nothing like nothing like what we're facing right now as far as geopolitically. It is my belief, and it's just my personal belief, that you will not see this coming, that you will have the ingredients. There will be a, you know, we'll all look back. If it crashes in the next three months, we'll look back and say, oh, well, yeah, you know, we had the ingredients. We should have seen that coming. But to anticipate it in real time, and I mean, to within the day or within 48 hours, it's extremely difficult, <clears throat> especially when you're talking about threats being made by nations to dump other nations' uh, investment portfolios. <laughs> I, I'm not going to get that memo. That will happen in the middle of the night when we're all asleep and we'll wake up, I mean, assuming the Chinese did that, which is a huge assumption. But in the event that they did that, you would wake up to the market already being in free fall. So that's not something that that anybody could predict or you know anticipate. You could certainly look at this this window if you had a portfolio. There's some protective things you could do. You could touch. I mean, there's a lot of things to protect the portfolio, but um, but to know exactly when. And I think that's the value of the pits postulate is. Most likely it's going to occur six days before to three days after one of these full moons. So go get out your calendar, find the next three full moons, and look for that panic. If the panic's going to begin, it's going to begin around then. And so the first one coming up is September 24th. September 24th, would, the window would open. And um, it's interesting, we, we, from a technical standpoint, the markets... Are you talking five okay. days from now? Correct, and nobody thinks that's going to happen. And I'm not going to. And I'm not saying it's going to happen. It's the the, but you have the conditions there because you have you have everybody believing, and this is what's important. You have everybody believing, and in getting into one side of the economic boat. You have everybody believing that the Fed has rescued the markets, and because of that, the amount of put buying, the amount of insurance that that, that they're going to take out. The degree of leverage they're going to apply to their portfolio increases, and it, and it sets the it can certainly set the condition where if there is an event or extremely negative news hit the market, and they're 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 not positioned for it. And yes. That's how you can you create a panic. Y yesterday, Doctor Steve Pachitnik, I think I'm saying his name close to being correct, former S Assistant Secretary of State under, I think, three presidents, three or four presidents, going back to Nixon with uh, Henry Kissinger. I mean, this guy is an inner circle guy, a CFR boy. Uh, he was on Alex Jones's program. He told AJ that 
he fully expects Bibi Netanyahu to start the war on Iran next week during Yom Kippur. I mean, he flat out said he is convinced it's going to happen next week. I believe John Galt, uh, last week when you interviewed him, uh, alluded to that as well. Mm -hmm. What's your gut feeling? <laughs> well, I mean, just forget that you're on international radio <laughs> and you'll be held accountable for everything yes, that you're exactly. saying. Just pretend you're talking to me. Oh, talking to you? Oh, for sure it's going to happen. Oh, okay. yeah. um, All right. No, I think that um, the Israelis, like John Gold pointed out, and I agree with him, it, the Israelis are known for being unconventional. So you, you would that surprise me? No, I mean, it would not surprise me. Would I, would I take, um, you know, I'm a, I trade the markets. I mean, and I'm not an active trader, but I position trade. Would I bet on, on a crash on that day? Probably not. Would I, would I at least be aware that we're entering some turbulent, possibly turbulent times in the markets? And that is within that window? Yeah, I mean, it could happen, and, and if it happens, then I, the markets are not priced for that. I will tell you, they, and you can, let me do some research. You'll discover that the the markets are not priced for a Middle East war. Okay, let's, let's turn from you being an investor, your former Army Ranger. What would be the opportune time for Israel to launch a surprise attack on Iran this year? Not Yom Kippur. Um, the only reason they would launch an attack on Yom Kippur is to be totally unconventional and take them by surprise. Yom Kippur, like we, we just talked about the, the pit's window, that is going into a full moon. That is, that would be insane. That, nobody does that. No armed forces engage in military sorties, air flights, during the brightest part of the, the moon phase, which is the full moon. Uh, Typically, it's it's at the new it's at the new moon, which is the darkest part of the moon cycle. So, and that that new moon is around the well, it's not around. It is the fifteenth of October. So, give or take a couple of days either side of the fifteenth of October. So, so about mid October, that, it, militarily, as far as strategy, would be the the most likely time because of the darkness of the night that they would launch an attack. Darkness because of the night. I mean, as an airborne ranger, I mean, everything we did was in the middle of the night. We certainly w didn't want to be doing operations under a full moon where the, the, the ability to spot us without uh, night vision is heightened, obviously, around a full moon. I mean, that's just not a – and there has to be ground forces, at least special forces in country, you know, I mean, there was in Iraq, there's, there already is in Iran. So I would think that's highly unlikely, but because I think it's highly unlikely and the Israelis are unconventional, that's, maybe that's why they do it. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be, it doesn't make military, I mean, militarily, I don't know if it makes a lot of sense, but. Will they go you know, after Syria? before going after Iran, or will it be done simultaneously? Well, if I was them, I would deal with Syria. I would deal with Syria, and I would let, you know, Syria and Iran have a mutual defense pact, so if you deal with Syria, it's going to trigger Iran to get into the equation, but yet by triggering Iran to get into the equation, the Israelis can, I mean, Iran would look like the, it looks like they're involving themselves in, in something that's not of their affair. You know, so part of this military action, you know, I mean, it is geopolitical. I mean, they're going to have to... Do, all these nations are posturing before the world. You know, nobody wants to... It, it, if there is a Mideast war, the economy is not rallying off this. <laughs> there might be a temporary injection of liquidity by the Fed, but if you touch those oil fields... And by all accounts, Iran has already threatened to attack the oil fields in Saudi. The markets will not will and to close and to close the Strait of Hormuz. And they'll close. Yeah, that's they will definitely do that. So 
it's not it's it, it's not going to be good for the markets in general for the global markets. Who wants to get blamed for that? I mean, what country with with with, with all the with the state of uh, the economy globally? Who wants to be blamed for that? Well, uh, you would have to um, either bait and goad your enemy to do something, or you know, plant evidence on your enemy to justify the attack. I mean, that that's always a possibility that something happens very soon that countries are able to say, look at that. We've been warning uh, Syria has massive stockpiles of chemical weapons. Uh, we have evidence they were used. Uh, we have to go in. I mean, uh, Mr. Obama has already stated that even the threat of using he said the threat of using chemical weapons or moving the stockpiles would be the red line that if they crossed it, he would order a military invasion of Syria. So perhaps perhaps what's coming up on September 24, or I should say Yom Kippur 26, maybe it's an invasion of Syria. We just had today this uh, surprise massive drill where tens of thousands of of Israeli troops were were deployed to the Syrian border. I mean, we've heard for days that there was a, a massive mobilization of troops and and armored vehicles and artillery and air, you know missile batteries going up in in Israel. Now we know what it was all about. They they moved the troops to the Syrian border, and we also have naval maneuvers in the Persian Gulf by over twenty countries. That is a twelve day exercise that does not conclude until Friday of next week. So you definitely have the armada in place, and you're getting troops along borders under the pretext pretext of exercises, and exercises can always go live. And we have the U.N. General Assembly next week. Uh, Ahmadinejad is speaking on Yom Kippur, and Mr. Netanyahu will be there. Uh, He will not have his meeting with with um, Mr. Obama because Mr. Obama has got to be on the Jay Leno show and doesn't have time to meet with world leaders to stop World War III. So crazy stuff could happen next week, Aaron. It certainly could. I mean, you know, you're talking about an event, whether that event is real or a false flag or or it's hard to sort out who who is responsible. Um, Certainly the Israelis will... Will make a quick decision and, and begin their retribution if, if there was an event. And I think that those—that's the danger when you get in when you when you get into these type of scenarios. That's the danger is that you know the markets would call it a black swan. It's a it's an unforeseen event. It's incalculable. The cost. Um, it's very hard to prepare for it. Um, but the the nations are certainly getting their military forces into place. Um, and I don't think anybody's going to be able to, you know, nobody's going to be without excuse if this thing hits begins to over the next couple of months because, um, you know, the U.N. has already withdrawn their peacekeepers. <clears throat> Embassies are starting to close down. I mean, they're removing the diplomats out of harm's way. So it... All the signs. The war. All the signs for military action are... I mean, this stuff, in my opinion, is so choreographed because, I mean, can you imagine if if all the nation's diplomats were caught in the midst of of a full-scale war and you're, you're having... Well, they'd you know, get the same treatment as uh, <laughs> as, as the, the Libyan, uh, our ambassador to Libya, who, right. and who I, was I, raped I, and, and molested and, and uh, who knows what else they did to him. Right, so I think many nations are looking at the situation and are going to be making decisions or at least getting a heads up. I mean, the Russians clearly think there's something up. They're clearing out of Syria, if they haven't already. And, you um, know, isn't it interesting that Mr. Obama sent a homosexual to Libya as the U.S. ambassador and he, he ended up dying by being raped by a Muslim mob? You want to go there? You want to touch that one? <laughs> you want to pass on that one? I'll stick with the economics. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll, 
I'll pass on on that statement. But I think there is a, there is a spiritual significance to to what happened. Well, if um, look, we are clearly inciting the Middle East. The, this country has taken a moral position that it cannot defend, and I cannot defend it because we're immoral. Um, and um, let me explain that. I, I mean, Iran has accused us for a number of decades of being the great Satan. I don't believe we are the great Satan. However, it is not a huge leap of logic from their vantage point to see that this nation promotes homosexuality, which obviously clearly is banned under the Quran. Uh, we we are the distributor in and creator of pornography. I mean, there is a number of things, and so that when our State Department begins to go into these regions, and especially under the current administration, is as insensitive as it is, and as immoral as it is, to nations that are godless, but yet they still have a a medium, a, a modest level of decorum and, and restraint, um... Is it any wonder that uh, that they take issue with us? You know, and I'm not uh, I'm not defending their actions. You know, their ap- actions are deplorable, and and Christ would not uh, approve of it. But uh, we we seem to in the, in the United States um, think that they hate us for our freedom, and um, we need to understand that there's a lot more involved in it than the fact that we're free. That's right. Aaron, in, in the remaining uh, five or six minutes, let, let's talk about our um, the state of. Well, let's talk about how the believing Christians are going to get through this ordeal, and what each of us must be doing right now in our own personal walk as a Christian. What are you doing right now? What What is happening with you right now in your walk with the Lord? Well, I am uh, just preparing my family, preparing myself spiritually. You know, that's what I talk about over the next couple of minutes, just the spiritual preparation of digging in close to the Lord. Look, this is this is not the, the... The Lord is sitting in the heavens, and he is laughing. He is mocking the nations. And he is going to frustrate the council of the nations. And he, is in, he has this entire situation under control. None of this has taken him by surprise, and nothing to come is going to take him by surprise. And he is going to accomplish everything that he sets out to do. And his word is going to uh, not return void without accomplishing the purpose for which it was sent. So that gives me great hope and great confidence that the captain of the host is moving forward. And the gates of hell will not prevail. And there is nothing that, that is going to defeat him. Now... To the degree that I am found in Christ Jesus, to the degree that I am obeying, to the degree that I am walking in holiness, I'm going to be under that banner and under that protection. Merely quoting verses does not ensure me of protection. It's going to have to be a lifestyle of faith and a lifestyle of obedience in being where the Lord specifically tells me to be at that given moment in time. So... You know, I'm, I, I've been falling asleep listening to worship, just filling myself. You know, one of the things I'm not doing is I'm reading the news, but I'm not watching the news. I'm not watching. I believe there are spirits. I believe there's an emotional change that takes place when, when individuals view this stuff on television. You know, we've had conversations about that. Okay. It's one thing to, to read the news. It's another thing to have the corporate spin on it, the images, the music, the fear. It, it's a whole production. And I, right now I need the peace of God in my family. I need the peace of God. I need the mind of Christ. I don't need the, I don't need the, uh, the, the court jesters of Babylon chattering in my ear. And that's what a lot of this stuff is, is just chatter. You know, we're supposed to be aware of the times, but our stability is in Christ. And so I'm just, I would just encourage people to just dig into Christ. One of the things I'd encourage those with means to do is begin to look for opportunities that God is going to ask businessmen and women 
where are they going to sow? Because right now it's a time for sowing. It's a time for sowing into sowing the word of God as well as sowing money into ministries or into people that he brings into our path. And I, I know, Aaron, from just talking to you privately, uh, you and your wife, are, you're very aware that that uh, there's coming a day that you will be rescuing Christians who will be trapped in in, in very difficult places. Yes, I, I, I think that that's, you know, all of us have gifts to steward, and I think it's time that we give them back to God and allow God to work through us and tell us, you know, how best to steward the gift, who to share those gifts with, who to pour into, and who not to pour into. We need to be really not just doing this indiscriminately, but listening to the Lord. Um, Jesus, when he was here, he was he was only doing that which he saw the Father doing and speaking that which he heard the Father speak. He didn't go heal everybody. He didn't go multiply everybody's food. He was specifically moving through towns and touching those that the Lord wanted to touch. And um, I think it's, uh, I know that the Lord, hey, look, the Lord's going to be glorified. He's, he's, the righteousness is going to fill this earth, and he is going to set apart his people from the wicked. That's the other thing he's been talking to me about all summer. He is going to have a people sold out to him. And so it would behoove me and anybody listening to this message to run to the Lord. I, I, you know, the, there's a scripture in Second Chronicles chapter 16, the eyes of the Lord look to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is fully his. That should give those whose heart those who are committed to the Lord are going to be strongly supported by the God in this hour. And that should encourage the listening audience that to join with God. Don't ask God to join with you. You know, when, when the captain of the host appeared to Joshua, and Joshua said, Are you for us, our enemy? That was, he, was, he was corrected. Was Joshua for the captain of the host? Was Joshua on, on the Lord's side? And as long as he obeyed the Lord and did the command of the Lord, he was victorious. And when he sought counsel elsewhere, when he made alliances elsewhere, when he trusted in his own strength, it did not go well with the Israelites. And there has never been, I've never seen in my lifetime, a time when you, you need to know that you are walking upright before the Lord, that your your life is, is right in his eyes, is pleasing in his eyes, uh, that there is no hidden sin in your life, uh, that your affairs are in order, that you are aware that this could be your last day on the planet. Uh, I'm not overstating it. We are in a very dangerous time, and each one of us will have to know that we are living right for God and that his protection is over us. And if he chooses to keep us alive on this planet and allow us to live through these times, that is his sovereign choice. But if he chooses to take us out, that too is also his sovereign choice. So you should live every day as though this may be your last day on this planet. I want to pray for everyone right now. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I pray that you will repent of your sins today before the sun goes down, before you go to sleep tonight, and believe on the name of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you shall be saved. 